Jenny McCarthy Show. Oh! Uh, here they are sitting down right now. Meredith Vieira, Richard Cohen. He's got a new book called Chasing Hope. A patient's deep dive into stem cells, faith, and the future. The book is available right now. I've been a huge fan of Meredith throughout the years. And um, no doubt, Richard has been a, not only a part of her throughout her journalism years talking about him, but also in her heart. And I cannot wait to talk to her. Hi, Meredith. Hi. How are you? I love the, the magic of technology. I mean, it's the greatest thing that's ever been invented besides stem cells, let me tell you. I get to be a mom and work at the same time. It's fantastic. And it's you fantastic. live in our, one of our favorite cities, which is oh, Chicago. I Chicago. live there. That's where I met Richard, in Chicago. No, Hi, Richard. Welcome to my show. Hey, thank you. Where in Chicago? What were you guys doing? I worked in, uh, for CBS News in the, the Midwest Bureau, which was based in Chicago. Yes. And yeah, and Richard came in from New York. He was a producer. He came in with um, Leslie Stahl to cover a story, and we met in the bureau. And how long have you guys been together? Thirty-five years. Yeah. Thirty-five years. Thirty-five long. It is year. unbelievable. <laughs> that alone deserves an award. Yeah, exactly. The, this book, I think, you're going to be changing lives. Chasing Hope is the name of it. A patient's deep dive into stem cells, faith, and the future. Um, Richard, you were diagnosed with MS when in your 20s. Yeah, I was 25. 25, and it was your your father had also had it, correct? Correct. And, and his grandmother. And his grandmother. How much has technology and understanding of MS changed since then? Not as much as you'd hope. Uh, it, it has changed. Um, there are pharmaceuticals that are used for one kind of MS. It's not the kind I have. Um, because stem cells is recent, right? Well, stem cells um, in the last probably five to ten years. Wow, and I know it's made a tremendous difference. It really has. I mean, I I understand this word hope, chasing hope with my own son who was diagnosed with autism and had seizures that went into cardiac arrest. I mean, hope is what got me out of bed in the morning. Um, but hope you call you call it chasing hope. Was it always something you had or is it just recent you clicked into hope? No, I I didn't have hope. I mean, when you are told that you have a disease that they really can't treat, um, there's no reason to hope. Mm. It, uh, it just wasn't part of, it wasn't in my vocabulary. I just thought that uh, self-reliance, strength, uh, were gonna carry me through it, and... Um, and denial, and, and a healthy denial. dose of denial. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was interesting in the book. You talked about denial, how it does, and I could actually see how that could work. Oh, you know I, I, mean? I think if you, if you d deny the certainty of possible outcomes, um, that's very healthy because that lets you live your life. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I think, I think also too, if I would have taken the diagnosis that I've gotten for my son, the first day of the diagnosis as is he would not be where he is today. Um, they said, you know, he's going to be in an institute. If I would have went home and thought that, I can't imagine where he'd be. My institute was called Harvard in my head, <laughs> not the other kind. And um, he's made major headways along with doing stem cells. I've done stem cells for myself. I've done stem cells with him. I am a huge proponent. I've seen the difference. For people having MS, what is the difference that you've seen? I know you went to the Vatican, part of a, um, a, a test group. What have you seen with MS and stem cells directly in terms of advances and what the symptoms curing or not? Well, in the, in the phase one trial, um, two people got up out of wheelchairs. My, uh, my experience was not quite as exciting because one month after my first infusion, I got a pulmonary embolism, a, a life-threatening blood clot in my lungs. Not and related to Not this. related not at all. And, uh, and I was also diagnosed with another autoimmune disease. So the assault on my body pretty much worked against what the stem cells at least potentially could be doing. But, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be treated in the phase two trial. Good. And... Um, 
I'm hopeful that that'll make a difference. But I'm and seeing things, Jenny, like Richard used to fall a lot, a lot. I don't remember the last time you did fall. No, that's right. It's been quite a while. So I don't know if that you can attribute that to the stem cell therapy, but that's a marked difference from the way Absolutely. he was before. And he just seems he stands taller. People who see Richard, I haven't seen him for a while, go, God, he, he looks great. They don't say that to me. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm he's gonna, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to you in a minute. <laughs> no, but, I'm kidding you. Um, in terms of, let, let me ask you this, in terms of having to have the strength, because I watched you for years, Meredith, on The View, the Today Show, and I knew um, going through having to put on a smiling face for the cameras when your heart is in so much pain. I watched you and related so much. I don't know if you were in pain or were you just carrying on? How did you manage? Well, there were times, certainly when Richard went through the bouts of colon cancer, um, that was a very difficult time for us and for our family because already he had, he'd already had uh, this diagnosis of, diagnosis of MS. That should be enough for one person. Absolutely. Not, not now have two rounds of colon cancer. But, you know, you have a job to do. And I, I mean, actually being on television and being able to connect to other people, um, it, we say this about our kids, that they're more empathetic because of Richard. I think I'm more empathetic because of Richard as well, more in touch with feelings and people's emotions and, and wanting to connect. So that was therapy for me really wow. to have that 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 platform where i could really connect to other people and share their stories and their pain and so it, it's sort of when you share the load it's a lighter load clearly that's so true and you know you're helping people while sharing exactly it. why are we so behind why is our health care and our medicine so behind versus the rest of the world in discoveries well a lot of it has to do with the fact that that um Going back to George W. Bush, uh, he made it very difficult uh, to get stem cells because they were um, embryonic. embryonic stem cells. And he was a very strongly anti-abortion, and um, those issues were very closely tied by, uh, by the church and, and by members of mm. people who had that, those opinions. And, um, and he... You know, we we sat back and and inched forward when uh, Israel and England and even China were taking giant leaps forward. And wow. um, but I think I think you know because most stem cell work today is done with uh, uh, adult st cells, and because using your own cells is uh, the trend in medicine. Uh, we've gotten out from under that controversy. Good. And I think we're moving very quickly in, in this country. But I so also think... Oh, go, oh, go ahead, ahead no, you, I you think one ahead. of the other issues has been um, that uh, research in the past has been done, you know, in, in almost this... They talk about silos where a researcher in like Chicago, they're doing their research on MS. Somebody in New York is doing his or her research on MS. Nobody's talking to each other. Right. And they, what we're discovering is that when you, when you pool your assets, your knowledge, it, you can fast track treatments and therapies. Absolutely. Have you ever had Victoria Jackson on your show? The, she, she made her money, her fortune in cosmetics. I don't know if you know her. She's really interesting. So. She, uh, I bring her up because her daughter was diagnosed with a, a disease called NMO, which is often mistaken for MS, in 2008 uh, when her daughter was 14 and was told, there's nothing you can do. Your daughter's going to die. Wow. And she would not listen to that. So she started a foundation. She said she went from um, mascara to medicine. She started a foundation, <laughs> and I, I mention it because it's a blueprint for folks out there dealing with illness. Now, in her case, she had a lot of money. But um, the approach was she went to researchers around the country and said, if you want my money for research, you're going to have to work with this guy and that guy and this woman. And, and she pooled all these people, and now it's 10 years later. Her daughter is not only alive and thriving, she's in law school. 
That's they haven't. Amazing. It's amazing. So I think in some ways, and there's this movement called patient centricity, and it's patients like you did taking healthcare into their own hands and not taking a diagnosis as that's the given word. And yeah, you you have to do your research. You have, have to, to be proactive, and you can get things done. You really can get things done. Thank God for the internet because yes. we can you know transfer information and share information. I did the same. I did exactly what you said. I started a think tank with doctors around the world and we have it once a year and we fly them all in and I sit in the room and I listen to all the greatest and latest and stem cells is on the top of our list every single time um do you think that uh first of all is it undone are the restrictions untied now the George Bush restrictions pretty much pretty much well they're just not using embryonic stem cells in most research because they're not as effective so once you take them off the table, there's no controversy. That's why the Vatican holds this conference. The first time we went in 2013, we went stem cell therapy, a, a conference at the, at Vatican? the Vatican. Right. It just yeah. seems so it polar makes sense. opposite. Exactly. Yeah. And wow. and they they definitely wanted to be on board to show that they're not against the science. They were they had a real issue with the embryonic cells. So now they're incredibly involved, and they have this conference. Every couple of years, it was started. Actually, the the person who convinced them is a Jewish doctor, woman, <laughs> Robin Smith from New York. I love it. Yeah. So there I, you go. So so th- is this something that people can get now, or is it still in trials in America? It's still in trials for the most yeah. part. Okay. Um, but people with any, first of all, if if you name an illness, there's probably something going on. I mean. Yeah. It, everybody in the world is doing this. And I, I think one of the things that pe- people ought to do if anybody in their family has any illness is the first thing I would do is, is check out to see if there are clinical trials. And if so, how have they been successful and when will it be available? Absolutely. I know a lot of our parents in the community, when we start hearing about stem cells, they ran to Mexico. People, tons of people fleeing to Mexico to get their stem cells done. And what was the result of that? Amazing. Really? Amazing. The stories that I've heard from stem cell use has been just like you said, people getting out of wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we are that behind with the rest of the world, first of all, I'm grateful that the rest of the world kept going while we took a back seat. But now that we're catching up, having your book come out and spreading the word about stem cells and making this a dinner topic conversation rather than taboo, because people are still very confused by the two. Absolutely. So I'm glad you took that, you know, off of the table of being you know, dangerous or unethical. Um, Richard, I want to talk to you a little bit more. The book is called Chasing Hope. I want to plug it again. Chasing Hope, a patient's deep dive into stem cells, faith, and the future. Um, What keeps you going when you have a bad day? Oh, I think um, just a a good outlook. I mean, uh, bad days, bad days uh, outnumber good days, but they're not... But they're not the kind of bad days where you're fighting fighting a raging fire. You know, it's just on on my average day, I just don't feel great. I have no energy. Fatigue is the biggest complaint of uh, MS patients. I have extreme fatigue. Mm. And um, you just sort of roll with it. You know, you just, you got to live your life. And... Uh, the worst thing you can do for yourself is to become a victim, right. you know, to see yourself as a victim. I think, uh, I think people who are dealing with illness need to uh, project strength, but f- feel it, feel it, not just project it. And, um, you know, you just got to keep going. You know, and uh, sometimes you just fake it for the day, you know, like, oh, oh, everything's okay, (laughs) you know, and fake it till you make it. So, it's true. Yeah. You know, Meredith, I had a, um, I was in a relationship with someone that was um, bipolar, paranoid, schizophrenic, and it was every, for for years, it was a roller coaster of emotions where I would try to hold them up. And when they got back to baseline, I would fall apart. 
I would either fall or I'd get sick. I'd immediately come down with something. And I started, then I finally became aware of it. I went, oh my God, every time I'd work so hard to build them up, I would then fall to pieces once I stabilized the other person. Did you find yourself having that happen to you? Yeah, a little bit. Um, sure, because in, in your moments of solitude, uh, you feel the weight of it. Um, you know, when, when you're dealing with somebody who's ill, you're dealing with them. So you're going through those motions and, and just helping or whatever it is. And then when you step back, it can sometimes be overwhelming. But I think we're good support for each other. Um, you know, when people say to me, are you Richard's caregiver? I said, well, yeah, he's mine too. You know, mm -hmm. it's a two-way street here. And, and we exist on a great deal of uh, humor. That's you been guys our, do. our yeah. That's been our thing. That's been our coping mechanism, and it and it's it's been good for us for sure. I'm sure laughter is a, oh. it is indeed a great medicine. It's a great medicine. Yeah. Talk about that moment that you talk about in the book where um, you had fallen, Richard and uh, Meredith. You wanted to call the police. It's a very emotional moment for me reading that. Yeah. Well, I. You know, it's very easy or very common, I should say, for people who are dealing with illness to become very self-absorbed, you know, and really not see beyond their problems and not take into account other people in the house. And I think that's exactly what I did. I, I really put my own emotional needs above Meredith's and... Um, I refuse to get help, you know, and uh, I just, I just put her, her in a terrible, terrible position because she's a lot smaller than I am, and she hurt herself trying to help me get up, and um, and it was bad. It was bad on my part, and um, when she threatened to leave. Um, she actually only made it into the backyard, but, uh, but, uh, well, I got yeah, out of the house, but I, took, <laughs> but I took it seriously. I mean, I, I got one of these pendants that, uh, you can just ring, you know, call for help, call for help. Uh, I, I had reached the point where I was so scared if I went out, what I would find when I came home. Would Richard be, I mean, there was a time, like I right. said, when he was falling all the time and, and just missed like slamming his head into something or whatever he was always like an inch away from calamity um and and i was just nervous all of the I time would be too I yeah mean, that would be the biggest fear of like what am i going to come home to i need to know that you're going to be okay. okay right exactly and but you also feel guilty like when richard would fall we i would literally have to drag him to to get him near something where he could stand and i, I my feeling was well look what he's going through i have no right to be angry, but something happened that night where I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I felt, and the police had been there before, I think once, right, Richard? I think they had. And they come in, they're great guys. We live they're, in a little town. Great. They're fantastic. Oh, hey, Richard. They lift him up, joke around for a little bit, and then they leave. You know, they're just lovely. So I didn't see what the big deal was in getting so having, help. So having that breakthrough, he did change after that realization. Yes. You He's still a jerk, but he doesn't... <laughs> do that stuff anymore <laughs> yeah if there if we were to have we haven't had that though it's so long now but i know that if richard were to fall we, we'd be totally comfortable or he would be calling the police i'm so grateful that you are bringing again those stem cells and the fact that he hasn't like you said fallen yeah. i do believe that there is some correlation with that there's i choose to too i choose to too and he also I, and i think it's important for listeners and i think you you um support this as well nutrition doctors don't talk about nutrition and Richard has changed his diet dramatically, and it's had a big impact as well on right? his overall health. So, and, and, and what did you eliminate? Like sugar, dairy, things like that. Uh, I'm gluten free. Yeah, sugar free, pretty sugar much. Sugar free, pretty much, and um, dairy. Dairy free. Uh, Huge difference. Huge. Isn't it, isn't it funny that they don't talk about diet? When it's the easiest, most simple thing, well, maybe not simple for some people, but it's 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 manageable in our own home. Exactly. Food. When I couldn't figure out what to do with my son, and I came home, I had no medicine, I had no I had no scholarly books, but I said, you know what, I can control food, and the difference it makes is extraordinary. So I'm so glad you brought that up.
Um, the book, again, is Chasing Hope of Patients, Deep Dive into Stem Cells, Faith, and the Future. People always get mad at me when I don't announce the book over and over again because they're sitting in their cars going, tell me the name of the book again. So I keep reiterating it. But I want to switch gears for a second. You both come from the world of journalism. What did you guys think of the White House Correspondents' Dinner? Do you think that they should be have a less of a roast next year? Well, I, you know, I, you get is what that? you, you get what you, what you ask for. I mean, that they were so shocked by Michelle Wolf. Michelle Wolf. I mean, if you, all you had to do was look at her stuff, and you know that that's what she does, and and that's what they hired her to do. So I thought after the fact, it was a little, to me, kind of disingenuous, you know, to say, oh, we we're in shock, um, but. I understand too where they want the the whole thing is to give scholarships I guess to young journalists so if they felt that this that was tainted by her stand up I I guarantee you they're going to be careful next time for sure yeah, I do feel like though that um it it is a roast right it's supposed to be that's what it's always been exactly. And to kind of change it now, we're getting a little bit in the world of two PC, and that bothers me too. Um, Richard, being also in journalism and news, how important is it for, with the Me Too movement, for women to be speaking up right now? Oh, I think it's very important. It, um, look, I mean, it's long overdue. And everybody, you know, people see this right now, um, especially conservatives, as a media story. And it's not just the media. It's it, this is all about men, and it's a cultural story. And you could go into any industry. You could go into academia, and any place, and find the same dynamics. And I think that the only thing that's going to end it is women coming forward and being heard. And being believed. And men coming forward, too. There have been many men, too, I think, that have come forward uh, with their stories. And why is it, Mary, why is it important for this to be a movement and not a moment? Because that's the only way we're going to change things. I mean, you know, we've had lots of moments, and then we go back to business as usual. I think it's a movement that has to um, continue to grow uh, as more people find their voice can you imagine? I think this is like the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing right now. And that's why yeah, some women who had this experience years and years and years ago and buried it are, are finding the courage to relieve themselves of it. They've carried that burden for so long. So, I mean, I, I don't think I ever experienced it myself. I've been racking my brains, did I? And I just blocked it. I don't think I did, but I know many women who have. And we have to change the environment. Uh, did we, did we, because I've had it happen to me, do, do we, is it just, I, I considered it the standard to be sad to say that, but it was the standard. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping this movement changes that standard, but what do you think? Why did uh, we stay I, I don't know. Um, I, maybe because we just felt it came with the territory. I mean, I was never sexually harassed, but I was uh, treated differently being a woman. Um, and and I kind of knew it, and that's probably why I worked 10 times harder than the men around me, just to prove something to myself and to them. Uh, but, but again, I think if we allow it to just be a moment, the behavior will continue because um, people in power feel they can get away with anything. And I think we have to show that you can't. That you, you know, I, I've been a boss and I've had people that are subordinate to me. I would never think to take advantage of that person. It wouldn't even cross my mind. Uh, and that to me is, is sinful. It's just wrong, and and I, I just would love to see it end, that the mindset is such that you would not dare to do it. Exactly. That's what I'm hoping for, and I'm so proud for all of these women speaking up and having the courage, and we're changing that standard. And you guys are doing the same with medicine and giving us hope. Chasing Hope is the name of the book, A Patient's Deep Dive into Stem Cells, Faith, and the Future. Richard M. Cohen, Meredith Vieira, what a pleasure talking to both of you. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Thank you. I really appreciate it, and good luck. And- You have a friend of me. Any more updates, please call. I'm happy to promote. Thank you. And share with us what you learned, too, about stem cells. I will. Absolutely. We'll be in touch. (laughs) We'll be right back, you guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Jenny McCarthy Show. Oh!